welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. In today's podcast, I am diving in to the French culture and sharing 10 ways to unearth your inner Francophile. And in today's petite pleasure, at the end of the podcast, stay tuned for a recipe that is as decadent as it is simple. So back to this passion for all things French. What are so many people from around the world drawn to and thus freely proclaiming their Francophile proclivities. What is it? While some of you listening may know with that question, like myself, that you have a strong fondness for the French way of life, I'd like to share some attributes of the French culture that can improve the quality of your everyday routine and overall contentment, and perhaps unearth any of uh, those unknown Francophile leanings that you have and kind of tap into those. All right. But first, I'd like to go into a bit of history about this love of France. Where did it all begin? Originally, it took root with supporters of the Enlightenment during and after the French Revolution. Francophiles, whether French or not, as we already know, were strong advocates for democratic ideals or governments by the people, rather than, understandably, autocratic regimes, which would involve monarchies and dictatorships, which were very prevalent at that time in Europe. And as enlightenment prefers reason and intellectual thought over tradition merely for tradition's sake, it's understandable how as a populace that was gradually gaining wider and wider access to education, facts, and opportunity, also came to appreciate the many ways of life that the French integrated into their culture. And as many of you probably already know or, or, or could derive from my blog, as someone who is regularly seeking ways to live a full life without the unnecessary and excess, as well as someone who is always seeking answers to life's endless questions, when I was first introduced to the French culture as a young college student, I was mesmerized and returned home forever changed. As readers of my blog, The Simply Luxurious Life already know the underlining foundation of how to live simply luxuriously derives itself from my appreciation for the French way of going about their days. With an entire page of posts in my blog's archives dedicated to French topics, French books, French cookbooks, French travel recommendations around the City of Light, I have turned my curiosity into a formal pursuit. Beginning with my study abroad in Angers, France, in 2000, and continuing with my most recent trips in 2012 and 2013, with each visit... My understanding grows, and even while those rose-colored glasses may begin to fade, I have a passion that continues to, to grow. I mean, it doesn't die. It's amazing, and my appreciation also is heightened. Okay, let's begin. Here are 10 ways you can unearth your inner Francophile. All right, number one on unearthing your inner Francophile is understanding the paradox that is the French culture. Now, by definition, that term French paradox came about due to a study that dealt with heart disease in relationship to United States, or excuse me, Americans versus French and with regards to their diets. And while I'll talk about that in a second, I want you, us to think about by definition, a paradox is two seemingly contradictory terms or ideas that actually do work together, that it actually is a truth that actually does function. And so this idea that you can eat more and actually look slender and be healthy, what? That seems impossible. But in reality, many people in, in France and all around the world too, and doesn't have to just be in France, but since we're talking about France, let's go there. Um, it, it, can, it can happen. Why? Well, there's many books out there, as, as we already know, that talk about this. It has to do with what you're eating, what's in the food you're eating, how much you are eating of that type of food. 
but primarily it is quality over quantity. What kind of food are you eating? But there's so many other paradoxes when we look at France too. And I think they're, they're in mesmerizing there. They, they make us curious. They make us want to ask why, how is that function? Why is it possible? But when it comes to everything, less is more. How is that possible? How can having less, less clothes, less makeup, less fuss, less, less home, less square footage, how can having less mean actually living a fuller life? And as we know, that is absolutely possible. But on the surface, in such a statement, less is more is a paradox. So they embody that. They embody this idea of, of eating well, eating, using butter in their cooking, use eating cheeses, eating breads, eating meats. And yet when done in a way that is respectful to the body with regards to how much they eat, one can look, feel, and be well. And again, many books out there about all that, but I love that. I, I, that that's one of the reasons I do, dove into Mariel Giuliano, Giuliano's uh, first book, The French Women Don't Get Fat. I mean, I think that's why many people did. It's like, how's it possible? It's not a fantasy, but, uh, and you do have to walk, but you walk to do your errands. You don't walk to sweat bullets. You walk to get things done in your everyday life. And it's amazing how by just tweaking different uh, ways of living in our life, we can actually live better, more healthily, but also enjoy our lives more. So there's some paradoxes there. So the first one, understanding the paradox that is the French culture. Number two, welcome everyday pleasures. Don't feel guilty about them. Go buy yourself a bouquet of flowers in the middle of the week. Pour yourself a hot cup of chocolate shod on Thursday. Why not stay in a hotel with your beloved for an evening? A very nice hotel. Treat yourself. Mix up the routine. Or go buy that brand new book you saw that you can't wait to dive into and put it in your library. These simple pleasures should not be things that we feel guilty about. Granted, we have to keep in mind our budget, but we can always save up. Granted, we have to be cognizant of our responsibilities. But if we are living consciously and we know what our priorities are, these everyday pleasures fuel us, re-energize us, and allow us to be a better self tomorrow, to be a better partner in the relationship to be a better coworker, to be a better friend to ourselves. So don't feel guilty for including these simple everyday pleasures. One of the pleasures that um, in my last visit to France, I noticed, um, and I also read about it in, in um, a few books recently, and I'll put a list of, of, of all sorts of books you can dive into about the French culture. But it was this idea that while, yes, they do go buy, um, many people in France go buy a fresh baguette in the morning, the croissants that we so associate with France are often that simple treat on the weekend or brioche is a simple treat on the weekend. It's not something you enjoy every day, but it is a weekly pleasure. I guess you could say that you can enjoy again, that idea of moderation. Yeah. I would love to have a, every, a croissant every morning, but it's probably not best for my waistline, but I can have it every weekend and I can absolutely revel in it and not feel guilty about it. So it's a matter of balancing, budgeting, living consciously, but also respecting yourself to treat yourself um, regularly so that you can be at your best. That's number two, welcoming everyday pleasures. Number three, we're going to talk about food really quickly. I talk about it a lot um, on various posts, um, but based on all sorts of different readings and all sorts of different studies, it's making sure that you're eating real food. Enjoy it. Satiate your appetite so you don't eat more than you, you should or need to. And then you move on with your day. It's about fueling your body, enjoying that food, eating it slowly, and not feeling an ounce of guilt. Now, a quick note, as I mentioned earlier about this study that was done from which this idea of the French paradox came from. In 1992, a, a study came out that basically rallied this idea that even though Americans and those living in the UK consumed more saturated fats and, and butter, excuse me, they, they consume less fat, saturated fats, such as butter and whatnot, than the French, 
the French somehow had lower rates of cardio cardiovascular disease than those in America and the UK. And it's like, what? And then another part of that study, an additional part, was that they believed it had to do with the French drinking more wine than red wine, specifically than those in the United States and the UK. Now, there have been disputes to this, and I want to bring that in real quickly, mainly because the American Society for Nutrition stated that, well, yes, that would be lovely. And while there are benefits to drinking wet red wine, um, and I'm not going to go into more detail than that, I'll, I'll get, provide you a link to the study. What really it came down to is that the French were eating more vegetables, more fruit, and their, their diet was more balanced. They ate in moderation. It wasn't about they can go out and eat all the cheese and sauces and as much wine as they want. No, they consume the food in moderation. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So this idea of you can eat more and look thinner, not necessarily true. It's about what you eat, yes. It's all about how much you eat. But if you eat quality food that's fantastically delicious and fresh, then you're going to be satiated and you're not going to want to eat more. So I just wanted to give you that information. I'll provide a link to the study and I'll also provide a link to the updated research um, that dove into um, debunking basically um, the celebratory, let's drink more wine um, belief. All right. One of the things that I really enjoyed my first visit to France when I went, um, when I was in school over there, my junior year of college was that for lunch, well, they served us lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and, and for all of those meals, all of those meals, we sat down, we were served. It wasn't anything extravagant, but it was coursed meals. We had two to four courses each time we sat down, depending on the meal that we were sitting down for. We always had a demi baguette to eat breakfast with, with some jam for lunch and for dinner. And with lunch and dinner, we always had wine. Red table wine was always on the table. But we sat, and for a good hour, you were sitting with your classmates and either talking or listening or just taking in the energy, observing and learning that culture for us students, even though the students were from around the world, was fascinating. I loved that moment. I loved coming in for breakfast, coming in for lunch, coming in for dinner. We could let our hair down. We could forget about school. We could just enjoy each other's company. And I think, and while I did that as a, as a child or as, as, a, as when I was living with my parents as a kid, we would sit down for dinner. When you're in college, it's very rare to do. It's very hard to do. And then when you become an adult and you live on your own or you start creating different traditions in your life, often different things take priorities. And so I just think when we appreciate that food that we're eating. We're, we're considering, is this good? Oh, it's not good. Okay. I'm not going to eat it. If it is good, slowing down, enjoying it and not just eating food because you have to enjoying the, the, the food that's presented in front of you, appreciating those hands that made it and slowing down and talking, enjoying the moment. Food allows us to slow down. Why not? Why not? take its advice. Why not allow for that opportunity to happen? Who knows what would be discussed? You just never know. All right. So number three is enjoying real food and not feeling guilty, luxuriate, luxuriating it in, I guess you could say, and taking the opportunity to slow down when you enjoy that food. All right. Number four is reveling in your true beauty. All right. So I just picked up a few weeks ago, this new book that just came out called how to be Parisian wherever you are, love style and bad habits. And it's written by four Parisian women. And it is first of all, fantastic. And I've recommended it on the blog. Um, but I just devoured this book and it, some of the, some of the things they shared were tongue in cheek or in the sense of you just had to chuckle, but a lot of it, while it's full of it's full of different paradoxes that I was just talking about before. It's also revealing that just revel in who you are, revel in the beauty that you've been given, make the most of it. And with regards to French, the Parisian aesthetic, less is more, as I was saying, but the idea is to look as natural as possible. Allow your natural beauty to shine through that. Now that does not mean going out without makeup unless you want to. Absolutely. But it's about, using just enough makeup to enhance your true beauty, using just enough, you know, 
accessories to allow your inner beauty and your best assets to shine. It's not choosing clothes to show the clothes off or choosing jewelry to show the jewelry off. You're accessorizing yourself, your life, whatever it is you're bringing into your life to allow you to be at your best self, to allow your best self to shine through. And I like that idea. Now, one of the things they talk about in the book is plastic surgery. While France is definitely behind America, thankfully, in this pursuit of of perfection when it comes to our outer core, it's this idea of respecting your body and the process it's going through. Whatever is natural, whatever is naturally you, to dive into that and to allow it to shine. So yeah, we're using makeup. That's not, I mean, my, I do have bags under my eyes or I do have dark, dark circles under my eyes. I'm going to use a concealer. I'm not walking out the door without it, but it allows my best self to shine the best self that I can do without making it look like I've got too much makeup on. And I think I love, I love that idea of taking the time to get to know yourself, not trying to be Giselle Bonchon, not trying to be Anna Wintour, not trying to be whoever it is that you look up to um, with regards to their style and their demeanor, whoever it is, being yourself, being inspired by them, but then making whatever you desire to project to be your signature style. So reveling in your true beauty, accentuating your true beauty. All right, we've just covered the first four. I want you to digest those really quickly. And we're going to take a one minute intermission and I will see you on the other side. Welcome back. Let's dive into the remaining six ways you can unearth your inner Francophile. So the fifth one is, and I love this phrase, get drunk on knowledge. All right. And I'm talking whether it's art, literature, music, architecture, history, anything that is something of educational value or academic or something that where you learn something you did not know yesterday. And as I spoke about in the first podcast of the simple sophisticate, there will always be something we can learn. There is an endless amount of information in our world. What a blessing, right? So what do I mean by getting, uh, endless knowledge. Well, it could be you're attending local plays or you attend plays when you're traveling. It could be you simply just travel and you absorb new cultures. It could be sitting down and reading every single night or dropping into a museum to view the latest exhibit that piqued your interest. A few periodicals and magazines that I enjoy reading to keep me privy to the latest art stage and book releases, as well as recent intriguing news and opinion pieces are the New York Book Review, or if you are in England or Europe, take a look at the Times Literary Supplement. You can also get that here in the States. Both of these supplements are ideal for news about recent books that are being released and authors. You might also want to take a look at the Atlantic Monthly Magazine and the New Yorker. That one comes out weekly. Atlantic comes out monthly, as it says, as well as the Wall Street Journal or New York Times to get perspectives from both sides of the aisle. Now, don't worry. If I rattle those off too quickly before you could grab a pen and write them down, I will share a list of reading options in the show notes, www.thesimplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast four. 
Some may scoff or be hesitant at this idea of staying abreast of politics, but let me begin to broach this subject or this hesitancy, this understandable hesitancy, I think, with a quote from the book, How to Be Parisian. Quote, a Parisian's thing is art, culture, and politics. She cultivates herself the same way she tends to the radishes in her garden with love, end quote. And I think what's understood there is this idea that it's a constant or consistent feeding of information, being privy to what's going on. Now, you don't want to drown yourself in certain aspects of this. That part may be too much, but just be aware. I think that's the key thing, to be aware, to be cognizant of what's going on, not only in your community, your state, your country, but also the world. A few other simple ideas could be picking up a newspaper, picking up your favorite piece of literature. Anything that piques your curiosity, it could simply be, hey, I don't want to read. I just need to relax. Turning on a bit of Bach, maybe um, some Miles Davis, something that stretches you, something that comforts you or enlightens you. There is a term that's used in how to be Parisian wherever you are that I mentioned earlier in the podcast that I circled, underlined, put a few stars beside. I loved it. Regardless of how much money you have, whether you are just getting by or you're extremely wealthy, there is a pricelessness to what we're talking about here on number five. Become or choose to become intellectually wealthy. You have absolute control over this. Thanks to the internet, you have information at your disposal ad nauseum. Granted, some sources are not of value um, and need to investigate the sources you look into, but you really can be someone who is constantly seeking knowledge. There's, there's even now, and I spoke about this, I believe over a year ago on the blog, there's opportunities for you to take university courses online for free from top universities around the country. Stanford, Virginia Tech. I just signed up for a course through Duke University on Coursera.org, and I'll put the link on the show notes. But endless classes you could take based on your interests and what you want to improve in. It's it's absolutely impressive and amazing. And granted, it's all about self-discipline. You have to choose to sit down and watch the video lecture. You have to choose to take that quiz. Um, but hey, you have that option to learn more. And why not take advantage of that opportunity? So number five, get drunk on knowledge. Number six, create everyday simple habits. When you create these simple habits that actually allow you to live a more productive and fulfilling life, what it is, is you living consciously. And for example, instead of having two tasks on your to-do list, I have to exercise, number one. Number two, I have to go do errands. And granted, your errands could be all sorts of things. And in some instances, you may not be able to do what I'm going to suggest. But say you have an errand that's close by. Instead of hopping in your car and doing it, why not put the dog on the leash, put your walking shoes on, and head down there two for one. You've exercised. You've also, oh, three for one. You've walked the dog. (laughs) and you've completed your errand. It may take a little more time than driving in the car to this place, but you've done three things when you were only gonna have done just one. So there's a way of rearranging your schedule, and that's just, again, an example. Some people live out in the country, and that's absolutely impossible. But if you live close by, or in decent distance, or you live in the city, it's something definitely uh, to consider, and also to make sure you don't have to do something extra, because our time is invaluable, and if we can, preserve some of that so that we can really enjoy those activities that we do choose to partake in, the quality of our lives improves. That's one example. It could also simply be eating really well, as I mentioned earlier. And when we eat well, we um, don't have to worry or feel guilty about what we ate. We, yes, we still need regular exercise, but we're feeding our body well. We don't have to down the road go, oh my gosh, I need to change my eating regimen. I need to change what, I mean, my diet. I need to change how I'm living. You're already eating well. You don't have to stress about that. You've taken an unnecessary stress off your plate and your life is improving and you enjoy your food and you feel great. So simple habits, try to incorporate everyday habits that can 
not add extra responsibilities to your plate. If you're looking for a few more specific examples, I have a post that gives you some some very specific ways to simplify your daily and weekly routines. And I'll include those on the show notes at the simply luxurious backslash podcast four. Okay. That was number six. Let's move on to number seven. Let go of the pursuit of perfection. Now I want to begin this section by pulling a quote from the book I've been referencing throughout the podcast, how to be Parisian while they're talking about beauty routines here what they're doing, what they did is focus on with regards to, Hey, moisturizing your skin every day, taking care of your nails, getting that massage, getting that facial or giving yourself a facial, not trying to change how we look, but to care for our skin, care for our health. And what they said is quote, despite all of these routines, the Parisian retains her little imperfections, cherishes them even the gap in her smile or her slightly crooked tooth, her prominent eyebrow or strong nose. These are the signs of a certain strength of character and allow her to feel beautiful without being perfect. What I love about that quote is that it's about owning our humanness. We are human. We're not perfect because we're a human. So why try to be something we can never be? And in owning that humanness, and not apologizing for those mistakes, we actually become more free. We let go of burdens. We let go of unnecessary stress and anxiety. I like to think of it this way. Um, With regards to being perfect or trying to please everyone so that we are perfect in other people's eyes, because I don't believe that we should go out and try to please everyone. Think of it like a politician. A politician tries to be what everybody else wants them to be. Certain politicians, granted, there are obviously other politicians out there. But part of the reason politician, at least in the United States, gets a dirty name for many people is that there's an inauthenticity to their pursuit of a vote. And it is those politicians that try to please everyone that often irritate people when in reality, the best thing someone can do, and often the people that um, gained sincere respect, are those people that are very candid about who they are, that are willing to have conversations and talk about what they believe in or what they're going to fight for. And it may ruffle feathers and it may not be pleasing to everybody. But for those people that stand behind them or respect what they're doing, there's a faithful follower. Because they know that person will not be a pleaser, be a doer, and be someone who's willing to change and grow and try something different, something new. And I think that's with us as individuals. We need to accept we're not perfect. We're going to have weaknesses. We're going to have strengths. But the goal is to try to let go of the goal of being perfect and instead pursue the goal of being our best selves. And that's all we can ask for. So that's number six, let go of the pursuit of perfection. Number seven is one I love cultivate an air of mystery. Don't let everyone know everything about you. It's none of their business. And maybe the social media has made this harder for people to do, or maybe easier depending on what you post, I guess. Um, but I think there is a sense of comfort when you know that, There are certain things about you and your life that no one else knows and they don't have to. There's a certain strength of knowing something more than those around you. And if everyone is doing this, then all of us obviously have things that no one else knows and it should bolster our strength in that way. I love um, this aspect of the Parisian or French woman putting up boundaries, having privacy, having moments to yourself. And some may say, well, Hey, you have a blog, you share your life with us. You're not really creating an air of mystery. I would simply respond by saying, I share as so should you what I am comfortable with and no more. And I'll leave it at that. So number eight is cultivate an air of mystery. Number nine, We're going to talk a little fashion now. After all, we are talking about France. Buy, wear, and love navy. 
the color navy that is. And, and, and what I mean by that is it could be simply found indiscriminately in a classic Breton or sailor top, or it could be a solid cashmere navy sweater. Navy is a neutral. Navy is seasonless. You can wear it in summer. You can also wear it in winter. It is the color that men wear in their day suits. It is timeless. It is what we wear with our dark jeans, after all. It can be paired with just about anything, and it is flattering on nearly every skin tone. I was just working with a client, um, a styling client recently, and I was looking at her color palette and I noticed that Navy was popping up in all the options for color palettes for every type of skin tone for the most part. And I was like, Oh, I love this. I advocate having Navy in your closet in some capacity, whether it is simply in dark denim, dark jeans or a scarf, or what about a Navy sheath or shift? a classic V-neck cashmere sweater, and of course the nautical top with the navy stripes. It is simply something that is always going to be in style, so never be afraid of grabbing something with navy in it. All right, that's number nine. Last but not least is number 10. Choosing and ultimately wanting quality over quantity in all arenas of our life. This idea, again, as we mentioned at the top of the podcast, of less being more, whether it's the clothing you wear, whether it's how much information you share, whether it's the type of foods you eat, less is more. And whatever it is that you are consuming or buying or doing, making sure it's of quality, something that lasts when it comes to clothes, something that's worthwhile for your body and its health something that's worth sharing that can build or strengthen or bond you with the other person you're conversing with. Less is more. Now I have another quote I want to share. One last quote from the book, How to Be Parisian. It says, quote, the Parisian never gives too much away. When it comes to revealing herself, she follows one golden rule. Less is definitely more. Keep that in mind, just as you go about your day too, with regards to your responsibilities, the, the, the goals you pursue, we're more likely to be successful and become an expert if we are pursuing a handful of things we absolutely love and are dedicated to than if we spread ourselves too thin and go after too much and wear ourselves out and then nothing get done, gets done well. Instead of trying to master all of the recipes, trying to figure out all the different ethnic food you could serve, why not master a handful and rest assured that no matter what menu you choose, it's going to be delicious and it'll provide a fantastic backdrop to whatever conversation arises. Same thing goes with simply how to live. Choose to focus on a few things, let go of others and you'll be amazed at what blossoms. So today we've talked about 10 ways that maybe you have realized you have a little bit of that Francophile um, residing within you. I hope you enjoyed it. I could always talk about France. So send your questions in if you have any to ask Shannon at the simply luxurious life.com and all of the things we talked about and I mentioned would be in the show notes. You'll be able to find those at the blog the simply luxurious life.com backslash podcast four. Now stay tuned for a petite pleasure that aligns with one of the things I love most about the French culture. It's delicious cuisine. In this week's Petite Pleasure, I'm going to share with you a cookbook that I have fallen in love with and then pull out a recipe that I've recently tried and am so excited to share with you. I shared on Instagram and people were asking for the recipe and I was like, oh, what a perfect time. I'll share the recipe on today's Petite Pleasure. Needless to say, I had this dessert last night and I will have it again tonight for dessert. And if there's any leftover, who knows how much longer. Anyway, 
It is that good. So the book, the cookbook I'm talking about is called Bouvette by chef uh, Jody Williams. It is a cookbook full of French bistro classic recipes that have an American touch to them. And it is inspired by her restaurant that is located in the West Village in New York City, as well as her Paris location in the Knife ninth um, arrondissement. Um, after I had the opportunity to dine at her New York location this summer, I knew the cookbook needed to be part of my kitchen repertoire. And having tried a handful of recipes, each one not disappointing, I decided to share with you the one that I um, let's just say it is satiating my chocolate fancy. Simply, it's a chocolate mousse or mousse a chocolat, and it is so simple, but you will be amazed how something so simple, as long as the ingredients are of quality, can satiate that, I guess you could say that sweet tooth or that need to have something a little bit decadent at the end of a special day. All right, let me get started, share with you the recipe, and perhaps get your mouth to watering a little bit, regardless of the time of day. Also, be sure to stop by the show notes as I offer some images of my attempt at this recipe, and as well, you'll also see a way that you could serve it, a different way than just putting it in a bowl. So, chocolate mousse, or mousse au chocolat, I guess is how you say it, right? Okay, it all begins as I've said before, with using quality ingredients, in this case, quality chocolate. So be sure to stop by your favorite chocolate tier shop and pick up eight ounces of semi-sweet chocolate. So that's how we begin, eight ounces of semi-sweet chocolate. I use 65% cacao in, in the chocolate that I picked up, but as long as you're in between 60 and 70, you will have all the flavor, not all that extra sugar, and you'll be satiated as well. So we have our chocolate. Place all of that chocolate with 12 tablespoons of unsalted butter or one and a half sticks. Put that into a stainless steel bowl over a small saucepan of simmering water. Or you could just simply use a double boiler, which some of us have in our kitchen, some of us don't. Either way, just make sure the chocolate isn't in direct heat um, on the stovetop and you have the water on simmer so that it can melt gradually with the butter and meld into one beautiful color. Stir it the entire time until it's completely mixed together and then remove the chocolate uh, mixture from the heat and just set it aside. Now you're going to use two different bowls. I want you to find one mixing bowl and one small little just dish. It could even be um, a small ramekin because you're not gonna mix anything up necessarily. You just need a place to put um, your egg yolks. So into the mixing bowl, put four egg whites. Take three of those yolks. You're gonna have a spare yolk. You can give it to your dogs for their coat. You can mix it into whatever you're making for dinner or breakfast or whatever, what time of day it is. You're gonna have a spare yolk. So put three of the yolks into that small ramekin or small little dish. Add a pinch of salt to those yolks and just mix it up real quickly. Set the yolks aside. We're gonna deal with the egg whites right now. So into the egg whites, I want you to put two teaspoons of sugar and then beat that with a hand mix mixer until you have stiff peaks. Okay, so a lot of air is getting into those egg whites. So the time that it's taken you to beat these egg whites will have been enough time for the chocolate to have cooled enough. So I want you to take the chocolate and take the egg yolks. And I want you to be very precise about this. Add one egg yolk, mix it entirely and completely into the chocolate at a time before you add the second mix third mix. So one egg yolk at a time until all three are incorporated. All right. Then we're going to add the egg whites. Take a spatula or a wooden spoon and carefully fold in the egg whites because you're trying to keep as much air and volume in this mixture as possible. So very gently until everything is, everything is mixed together. Okay. This is where the options begin. So you've made the mousse, you've made the mousse now you can decide how you're going to be serving it. If you are going to serve it in what you're going to find on my blog in just simple single uh, teaspoons, then leave it, in, leave it in the mixing bowl or the pot, the saucepan. Leave it in there, put plastic wrap on it and stick it in the fridge. Leave it in the fridge for up to four, excuse me, starting minimum four hours. Trust me on that one, four hours or up to two days. That's the good part. Why? You want it to be really firm. 
Now, if you are going to be serving this in small individual dishes, I recommend putting it into those dishes right now before you put them into the fridge. So maybe you'll do a little bit of both. Maybe you'll put them into dishes and you'll keep a little extra for the spoons. It's up to you, but make that decision now because it's going to be really hard to put them in individual dishes and make it look neat and nice after it's become really firm. Okay. So in the fridge, four hours up to two days with plastic wrap. Now, this is the good part when you serve it. There's a bunch of ways you could do it, as I said. And if you and what's fun about serving is you can it's about the dish. It kind of ha- offers a presentation of character and signature style for your your hostessing duties, or if you're serving to your family, just having fun with food. But you want to take it out of the the if it's in the bowl and find some spoons. This is what Jody Williams suggests in her book. And if you're using this for a party, it's a lot of fun. Just just dish out just enough for that spoon and put them all in a tray. Because honestly, one big biteful, and you'll obviously be nibbling on it, is enough. This dish is so decadent and so rich that you can slowly enjoy it and be completely satisfied at the end. But there's more to it. There's more. I suggest, and so does Jody, adding a little bit of whipping cream, Cool Whip, however you want to call it, but I would make my own to the top of the chocolate. Now, real quick recipe on how to make whipped cream. Simply take a hand mixer, add one cup of heavy cream, one teaspoon vanilla, and one tablespoon sugar. Mix until hard uh, or stiff or firm peaks form. And then you would just add a little dollop on each of the servings of the chocolate that you serve. It is so delicious. So absolutely delicious. This is going to be one you're going to want to put in your arsenal of recipes to master for hosting parties, for just an evening in the middle of the week, or for friends that stop by. It just is something to pull out of the fridge because you've left it in there since yesterday or the day before, and it's going to taste just the same. It's fantastic. So you'll find this recipe, mousse au chocolat, or chocolate mousse, on today's show notes, www.thesimplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast four, or, and I highly recommend it, pick up Jody Williams's book, Bouvette. It's awesome. It's full of wonderful bistro type recipes that are full on flavor. And they just will remind you of France if you've been there. And if you haven't, it will tempt you to go. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petite Pleasure, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast, where I'll recommend a book, a film, a recipe, or from time to time, introduce you to an expert who offers insight into how to live simply luxuriously, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration, stop by the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or subscribe to the weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox every Friday to help you stay caught up on the most recent podcasts and blog posts. Until next Monday, bonjour.